This brings us to question number five, and let's take a look at uh, its conditions. And of the following questions, which would be the most important for a teacher to consider when interpreting the results of a reading assessment for a particular student? So uh, once again, all of these options are, uh, are certainly possible, but we're looking for the best response. And I, I've gone ahead and I've, I've highlighted those, and that's one approach I would recommend that you, maybe you take to um, study, and that is not to do the test, just to mark off the answers and then look at it and try to uh, think through it. But it's your money and your time and, and your exam and your experience, so you do what's going to work for you, not what I tell you to do. Anyway, so if we use that, let's take a look at what the right answer is and see how they uh, got there. How do these students, uh, how do these findings relate to the students' performance and other recently administered reading assessments? So it's really about looking at the students' performance, <clears throat> maybe on a series of exams, and you're trying to establish what the baseline is uh, for that student's per performance, and then see where the latest administration of that assessment falls. This is the most student-centered response out of all of them. This is a response that really fits the uh, parameters for what we're looking at. If you look at the rest of them. Um, this one, for example, how did the student's performance on this assessment compare with other students' uh, classmates? That certainly is something you could ask, but it's not the most student-centered for the particular student in question and how that student is performing at a, at a given time. So A, a is out. It just doesn't fit the conditions as well as C does. Are these findings sufficient to assign a grade to the student's performance? Again, that could be a question that one would ask, but not in the context of what the conditions of uh, item 5 are telling us. Do these findings provide information about the student's rank, uh, ranking in regard to national norms? And again, you know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but that is not the first thing that should come to mind. Uh, since we're supposed to be treating students as individuals, then uh, what we want to find is the one that, uh, that does that, and that's uh, selection or option C. So let's take a look at six now, uh, if we could. And this says a fourth grade class. And remember, when you're looking at grade levels, it's important sometimes to think about if we're in the learning to read stage or reading to learn stage. In this case, I don't think it really matters uh, so much what stage we're, uh, we're in, because here it's asking about uh, two students with IEPs. And when planning classroom level and progress monitoring assessments for this, uh, these students, which the, 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 the teacher should do what? And of course, if the child's got an IEP, it has to be followed. So what the teacher has to do is read it. <clears throat> read it and see if there are any specific testing accommodations, more time, fewer distractions, whatever it says, uh, that have to be uh, uh, followed. If you look here, make arrangements for the students to be tested in an environment that is quiet and free from distractions. Um, well, you know, that should be done probably for the whole class, and unless there is something in the IEP that indicates that this is necessary, um, <clears throat> since most of these tests, uh, like state exams, require the students to be taking them under uh, nearly identical conditions, you can't just go in and, 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 and do what you want. Uh, consulting the reading language arts framework for what's appropriate, no, you have to follow what's in the IEP and then consult uh, with whoever's in charge of those uh, little IEPs to find out what is appropriate or whatever the uh, protocols are at the given site you're, you're at. But again, the A and B are outside the bounds of the, uh, the question anyway. So recognize that these students may require additional time. That's true. You know, maybe they do. But the point is that you've got to look in the IEP. That's the only response that's acceptable here. Okay, so if we go to item 7 now, this is about a 504 plan, uh, typically dealing with, uh, with behavior or health or something uh, like that. And we are, here we have a middle school teacher is preparing uh, for the class to take the 6th grade California standards test in English language arts. The teacher believes that a student in the class with a 504 plan would perform significantly better on the assessment if she were allowed to have frequent supervised breaks, which of the following guidelines would be most appropriate for the teacher to follow to ensure that uh, arrangements for the student during the test are appropriate. And in this case, it's only A, providing the student with this testing accommodation only if it's specified in her Section uh, 504 plan. And again, uh, you can't just make up what you want. you got to follow uh, the rules. 
Uh, using good teacher judgment to determine if such an accommodation is warranted. No, you have to follow what is stated in the, uh, the, the plan or in the uh, documentation. So that's out. Following whatever accommodations are generally recommended. No, these are going to be most likely specific. Um, requesting test accommodations for the student <clears throat> in writing, maybe that's something that you have to do uh, as part of a protocol, but that's not what's going on in this question. Only A is the appropriate response. Hopefully that's, that's clear by now. Let's take a look at uh, item eight now, if we could. Let me see if I can get this thing to, uh, to work, and I did. Uh, midway through the year, a second grade teacher convenes a student success team to plan additional support for a student who is performing somewhat below grade um, level standards in reading. Other members of the team include the student and her parents, another teacher who works closely with the student, a school administrator and a school administrator. In the context of developing an improvement plan for the student, which of the following pieces of information would be most important to communicate to the success team? So really, uh, after reading all that stuff, it's this part of the question that's most important. And the answer that is uh, correct within that context is D. And let's take a look at why D is correct. If you're going to convene a team together to address the needs of an individual student, and you're going to be spending a lot of time with family and taking time with uh, other teachers and with the student and especially with the administration, then you better tell them what they're doing there. Why are they at this meeting? <clears throat> a description of the student's assessed strengths and weaknesses that could serve as a foundation for addressing your needs, that is the best answer out of all of them. Other things that are on here are possible, like comparing uh, the student's reading skills with those of her peers who are performing at grade level. Certainly, maybe you could talk about the student in relation to others, but that's not the purpose of the meeting. Purpose of the meeting is to address what challenge the student has that's so drastic that it requires a team uh, effort. A list of the formal and informal reading assessments, those are certainly things you would bring, that's true, but the first thing that you need to do, because it says which of the following pieces of information would be most important, so we're looking again at what is most important here, and why are we here is what's most important. A list of appropriate formal and uh, reading assessments that could be used for summative evaluations. You know, A through B might, A through C rather, all of those things might come up during the discussion. Uh, but it's going to be a pointless discussion unless the members know why uh, they're there. And that's why D is correct. So let's take a look at this one next. And here we have a kindergarten teacher. If you see kindergarten, like kindergarten uh, and first grade, really we're, we're looking at foundations of reading. And these are going to be isolated skills, probably phonemic awareness, probably letter naming, uh, maybe letter sound correspondence, for example, and reading very simple CVC words. Uh, but usually these things are done in isolation. Don't, um, <clears throat> don't let me forget sight words. Uh, so look at this. Uh, the teacher is doing exactly that, a foundational level game. A kindergarten teacher plays the following game with the students. The teacher says, guess whose name I'm going to say now? The teacher then uh, says the initial uh, sound. Uh, let me try that again. I'm sorry. I can't go back and record this. The teacher says, guess whose name I'm going to say now. The teacher then says the initial sound of a student's name. For example, mm for Mariko. And the children try to guess the name. This activity is likely to promote the uh, reading development of students primarily by, and it's this one right here, as we see, B, recognize um, that a spoken word is made up of sounds. And that's all that's happening here. We're you know, uh, trying to do initial sounds. How are they do How's this teacher doing initial sounds? By using something familiar, by using a familiar uh, thing like a student's uh, child's name. Uh, blending separate sounds into words is not happening in here. I don't see any blending at all. There's no cat cat going on, so that would be out. Understanding the principles of phonics, nope. That would mean that the students are seeing print. Anytime you see phonics, that means that the student is seeing print in some way. And in this uh, instance, this is all phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness does not use print. Phonemic awareness could use pictures. It could use uh, you know cards where you're, you're moving <clears throat> pennies into, into different slots to mark 
the sounds heard in a word like ka, at, uh, so that you can have some tactile sensation going along with it. But phonemic awareness does not use print. This doesn't use print. It is not phonics. And it is certainly not learning how to spell their own names. Now, maybe a byproduct would be if the child is able to name the letter and uh, identify the sound M, M, and then write the letter M that's possible. But that's not what's going on here. This is a very basic, basic activity. If we look at item 10, uh, we see it says, which of the following informal assessments would be most appropriate to use to assess an individual student's phonemic awareness? Again, since you see phonemic awareness in here, remember, you're not going to be dealing with any print. You want to make sure that you avoid picking any answer that deals with print uh, in here. And so if you look at the correct response, which is A, asking the student to identify the sound at the beginning, middle, or end of a spoken word. What sound do you hear at the end of step? This is where you're, you're trying to find out if the student is getting those uh, initial, final, and medial sounds. And it's usually in that order. Sometimes the medial sounds are a little bit hard to hear, uh, but usually consonants at the uh, start and end of words are a little easier to, to get. So A is the one that's correct. If you look at this, having the student uh, listen to a tape-recorded story while looking at the book and then answering several simple questions about the story, I mean, this is working on some very basic book concepts, maybe some listening comprehension and things like that, but it's not phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness, again, is dealing with sounds, individual sounds, 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 pictures and sounds, sounds and sounds, multisensory techniques, things like that. C is also wrong, asking the student to identify the letters in the alphabet that correspond to the initial consonant sound of several spoken words. Again, phonemic awareness deals with sounds, not with print. Having the students listen to the teacher read aloud a set of words with the same beginning sound and then repeat the words. That does work, perhaps, on uh, a phonemic awareness in a, in a way, uh, but this is perhaps more complicated because when you're dealing with uh, consonant blends that you're having the student listen for, that is a more advanced than uh, what you see in, in A. A is uh, really uh, looking at specific things like beginning, middle, and end. And that is what's going on here. This is an assessment where you'll learn if your learner can get initial, final, and medial sounds. If they get all of them, then they're ready for a new set of uh, uh, set of instruction. If not, then you know that you have to, um, you'll have to uh, take, dial the instruction back. Like if the child's not getting uh, initial sounds, then guess what? You've got to work on initial sounds. So that's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, so anyway, one thing that I wanted to uh, point out before I go on to the next uh, set of questions, if I, if I may, and just give me a moment to, uh, to do that. Uh, that again, and I won't mention it <clears throat> in every video, but I'll just drag this into the window uh, here. If you go over to my YouTube channel, Busalis, and look under the playlists, the content for uh, reading is under the reading instruction lectures right here. So I really recommend that you uh, watch it because it's going to give you the content that you need in order to understand what these questions are asking if this is sort of your first run through with the stuff. Okay, I'll come back and do the next items.